We'll get to episode 206 in just a moment, but before we do, I'd like to ask for your support of I Can't See You. When you're shopping in Amazon.com this holiday season, I would appreciate it if you use my affiliate link, ICan'tSeeYou.com slash Amazon. That will take you directly to the Amazon.com homepage. Shop from there as you normally do. Check out as you normally do. It doesn't cost you anything more. And I earn a small commission on most purchases. Some purchases, I don't earn anything. Again, that's ICan'tSeeYou.com slash Amazon. Thank you so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. From Studio B in Swarthmore, this is the I Can't See You podcast with David. It's like blind people for dummies. Hello there, and welcome to episode 206 of I Can't See You. My name is David, at David Benj on all the socials. I really do appreciate you joining me for this episode of I Can't See You, and I've got a very nice story to tell today. There's blood in everything, (laughs) but I will get to that in a moment. And please forgive me. I know my voice actually sounds pretty good right now, but I've had a cold since coming back from the NFB convention in Pittsburgh, the state convention in Pittsburgh. So I am still struggling with a runny nose and a weird voice and stuff like that. And I'll get into all that once, (laughs) once I get into the meat of this episode. But of course, it's football season. So before we get to that, let's talk about fantasy football. And I really want to talk about it this week. Again, if you don't like it, let me know and I'll stop doing it. But I haven't heard anybody say, you know, STFU uh, yet. So if you want to say that, all you have to do, send me a send me a, an email that just says that or call the line 646-926-6350 and just say STFU. And I'll know that that's for the fantasy football. But right now I'm going to talk about it because I had a great weekend. I won in both leagues. I'm in first place in both leagues. In the all-blind league, I am at the top of the table because the guy who was first lost. So I am number one again. And I don't know that I ever made it back to number one last year after I started off 6-0, and oh, but this year I did. So let's see if I can hold it. Well, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. You know, it's one injury away from the whole season crashing out. And uh, in hockey, I lost, but I moved up. So let's just recap. Three weeks ago, lost the game, moved up in the standings. Week after that, won the game, dropped in the standings. Last week, lost, and then moved up again. So I'm number three in the fantasy hockey league that I'm in. And again, that team name there is Moongate Slapshot, which is Ziggy's AKC name. Moongate is the breeder. And before we move all away from fantasy football, I just wanted to give a shout out to Nick D'Ambrosio because he had some serious medical issues. <laughs> and uh, I'll get into more medical issues in a moment and how I found out about his medical issues. <laughs> but I did text with him a little bit the other day. He had angioplasty on three different Uh, arteries. They were very, very blocked. And he did say something to me that kind of resonated. And it kind of resonated even before speaking with Nick, because as I mentioned a few months ago, I had a cousin that passed away uh, earlier this year. And, uh, you know, as Nick told me the other day, life is short. Um, The doctor had told him they got him right in to do the angioplasty in an emergency basis. Because as the doctor told him, he was too young to die. Uh, And Nick is a couple years younger than I am. You know, his birthday's coming up. You know, it's funny, so is mine. You know, it's even really funnier. They're on the same day. (laughs) So on Monday, think of Nick. Nicky Pools, as he talks about in the fantasy football documentary, which I will not give the address to in (laughs) in in this episode. So... Please, Nick, get well, take care of yourself, and I hope all is well with you up there in Montreal. As I mentioned last week, I was going to the National Federation of the Blind of Pennsylvania State Convention in Pittsburgh. It was fun. And there were a lot of great moments there. There were some not great moments, and I'll get into those, as you could tell by the title 
of this episode, there was a lot of things that went on there. So let's start off on the way out. We took Amtrak out there, and I may have mentioned it last week. There's one train a day that goes to Pittsburgh from Philadelphia, and that left at 12.42 p.m. So Liz took me and Simon to the train at 30th Street. And when we got there, we were surprised we couldn't find anybody else in our party who was going to Pittsburgh. And we're like, what's going on? I know everybody's here. And we were there probably a half an hour before the train was leaving. So we were a little curious. Simon and I were just wandering around uh, the main level of 30th Street Station. And I was calling a few folks and texting a few folks. And I got nothing back. So I was a little concerned. Did we miss the train? And I thought, well, I, I knew it's 1242, but my God, we don't want to miss that because there's not another easy way to get to Pittsburgh. So finally, we went, we found out where the platform was. And it, it was kind of funny. Walked over to the information desk. And I don't know if the lady didn't see my white cane or if she was busy doing something else. But I asked her, I said, the train to Pittsburgh, and she said, yeah, that's on, I think it was track nine. And I said, and I pointed, is that in front of me? And I pointed that way, meaning in front of me, meaning behind her. She said, no, it's behind you. I said, okay, thank you. She didn't offer to help. She didn't offer anything. That was it. That was the end of that. So we go over to where I believe the escalator was down to track nine, and the guy said, are you here to go to Pittsburgh? I said, yes. I said, we're looking for some other folks in our party. I know there was a whole bunch of us going. I, I don't remember how many were on the train, probably 15 to 20 people. Oh, they're already down there. I said, oh my gosh, what do you mean they're already down there? Is the train here? And he's like, yeah, we're, they're, they're probably already on. I took them down maybe 10 or 15 minutes ago. And I'm like, wow, I didn't realize the train was here that early. So he said, give me a minute and I'll take you down. And I said, well, you know, we're okay going on our own. And we took our suitcases and we got on the escalator. Simon was in front of me in case I fell, he would break my fall. <laughs> he was not in front of me to break my fall. And neither of us fell, so we're good. So we got down there and someone else, her name was Cindy, took us and got us on the train and got us with all of, all of our friends and again, I don't know how many were there, uh, but there were a whole bunch of folks, uh, both from the Keystone chapter, which Simon and I are a part of, as well as Greater Philly. And maybe there was even somebody else from one of the other local chapters, which is Brandywine. I, I don't remember. I, I think there was somebody from Brandywine on there. I'm not, not quite sure. I think her name was Alice. We take the train out there. Simon and I sat together. Lisa was already on. She was with Donna. Don, I think it was Donna's first convention. Uh, Becca Weber was on with her cute little dog, Puff. My God, that dog is so cute. Sorry, Ziggy. <laughs> it's like a miniature version of Ziggy. It's a, it's a golden retriever lab mix. And of course, um, again, not to put down the golden menace, but uh, Puff is very well trained compared to Ziggy. Uh, and maybe trained to be less rambunctious than Ziggy is. Today is Ziggy's birthday, by the way. So if you have birthday greetings, you know the you know the normal places you can you can shoot him <laughs> you can shoot him belated birthday wishes because I'm pretty sure by the time I get done all my coughing fits and nose blowing that I'll be doing <laughs> through this episode, I don't know that it'll get out until the day after his birthday. The train is long. It took a long time to get to Pittsburgh. It's about eight hours. It's supposed to only be about seven hours and change, but it was actually probably over eight hours because there was some some sort of construction work outside of Harrisburg, and uh, we were delayed by half an hour. We spent a good chunk of that time in the cafe car, and it was uh, Becca and I and Lisa and Donna. And one of the things that I took away from sitting there in the cafe car, other than the nap that I took at the table <laughs> with the others, was... Becca was helping Donna with JAWS. JAWS is a screen reading software that allows folks who use Windows to use a computer. And it is much more, I, I don't want to say easy. There's, it, there's no invent, reinventing the wheel. For example, and I've mentioned this before, when you're using VoiceOver on a Mac, to hit enter, 
you have to hit the VO keys, which is control, option, and then spacebar. So you say VO space. So you have to hit three keys to hit enter. You know what you do in JAWS? You hit the enter button. And so every command on a Mac is very different from the actual Mac commands, whereas in JAWS, a lot of the commands are the same as the Windows commands. You can use tab and things like that. So I've been toying with the idea of getting an inexpensive Windows laptop and learning, or I should say relearning JAWS, because I was taught JAWS at the place in Chester called CBVI, and don't ask me what that stands for. Blind Visually Impaired, Center for Blind and Visually Impaired, maybe. It it used to be called something else, (laughs) and I don't remember what that was called either. So so CBVI in Chester uh, taught me that, and that's where I met. I actually met Warren Knight, who is the main reason, he's the only reason that I'm in the NFB. He called me about six or seven years ago and said, hey, I'm, I'm looking at this organization. I started here. It might be something you'd be interested in. Why don't you come to a meeting? And I said, okay, sure. And I did. And the rest is history. And now I'm treasurer of two different uh, parts of that organization. Yeah, I'll tell you about that in a minute. The one you already knew about. So listening to Becca, who seemed really, really good at JAWS, to the point where we're going to have her on White Canes Connect doing little JAWS tutorials in episodes. But listening to her teach Donna or show Donna what to do made me think, I, you know, this might be something I should do. Uh, it's getting harder and harder for me to read on a computer no matter how far I zoom in, no matter what I do. So I, I got to learn it. I have to. And the days are drawing near where – I'm not going to be able to zoom in enough to see something, to read it. And uh, I remember on an episode of That Real Blind Tech Show where Stephen Scott was talking about using font sizes like 72 point or something so so he could see stuff. And, and I just keep thinking about that as I'm having difficulty read stuff on my computer, again, zoomed in and stuff large and everything else. So I know it's something I'm going to need. And I will still use the Mac while I can. We get to Pittsburgh. It's late at night. And the really cool thing about where the hotel was, was that there are are a whole bunch of eateries right along this one street. And when you're blind and you can't jump in a car and just drive somewhere, there were probably six or eight choices right down this one street. The problem is... Pittsburgh closes early. Even the Hard Rock Cafe closed at 10, and I don't know what time they stopped serving food. So our only option for food was a place called Home Run Harry's. And we went there. It's a sports bar, which was very cool. Each table had a TV on it that had, I I think ours had, I'm not sure of the game. I think it was the Lakers. And there was a huge TV. I mean, huge, like you would see on a TV set. I I don't, I I can't even guess. Might have been 10 or 12 feet high by however wide. And it had a hockey game on. I I don't, again, I don't know. It was too far away. I I could just tell it's hockey because it was so bright. So that was very cool. But the sad part was the music was so unbelievably loud. It was very difficult to talk to the others at the table. And there were six of us at the table, plus Puff, who was under the table. So we were able to do that, which was very cool that it was there. And again, it was maybe 100 yards from the hotel. So we did that. And then Thursday, things got going. And first thing on Thursday, fortunately for me, I was getting a headshot. And I had wanted a headshot because everybody that I knew had one. (laughs) And I wanted something decent taken by a professional photographer, and it was a fundraiser for one of the groups uh, that Stacy is involved with. It's the uh, Blind Parents Group. So they were able to raise a little money, and it didn't cost a lot. It was $25. There's no way I could do (laughs) pay $25 to get a headshot. So I had that done first thing on Thursday morning, which was good because there was an incident later on Thursday that I'll talk about it (laughs) in a minute that would have been an ugly headshot. (laughs) So, 
So the rest of Thursday went on and there were some, some things going on. Uh, I got to see a lot of folks that I hadn't seen in a while and talk to them and was just able to, to hang out with folks, which was nice. Thursday night, we were supposed to go to Promanti Brothers. And I'll tell you why I didn't go in a minute. Friday's schedule was I had to work the NFB Newsline table in the morning. And then there was a Pennsylvania Association of Blind Merchants meeting at 1 p.m., at which time I was elected the treasurer. <laughs> so that's my second treasurer duty with them. So I've got those two going for me. No one else wanted it, of course. I asked several times. <laughs> and Stacy stole my thunder because when they put it up to a vote, all those in favor say aye. Of course, I didn't say aye. And then when she was going to say all those opposed, she, well, she didn't do that. And when she said, okay, he's elected, David's elected treasurer. And I said, Stacy, you took my thunder. Where's the all those opposed? She said, I knew what you were going to do. And she did because I did it during the Keystone meeting when I was elected treasurer last year. <laughs> so, so I'm treasurer there too. And that was a good meeting. It was it was I was a little disappointed with the number of people there. There weren't there weren't a lot. I did get to meet um someone who is from the Pittsburgh area who's part of the BEP. His name is Robert and it's funny he kind of reminded me of my dad because he said to me at the end of the meeting and we had talked earlier in the day while I was waiting to get my head shot when I first met him and he told me he said you just got to get in there. You just got to get into the BEP. And, you know, don't let them tell you no and just get in there. So I, I told him I would give it a go. So we'll see what happens once I get a hold of BBVS. And in fact, the head of BBVS actually spoke on Saturday at our general sessions. And uh, I've got her contact information and obviously we'll go back and forth with her. And I'm sure at some point have her on in an episode of White Canes Connect. Saturday, like I said, was all sorts of different speakers, and always it's always great to hear from some of the folks. Some of the people uh, who presented, we kind of knew about Dr. Hurd and Dr. Marone from uh, White Canes Connect episode 51. They gave a little brief synopsis. The day before, though, on Thursday afternoon after the Blind Merchants meeting, they did this presentation that was outstanding. Dr. Hurd brought some books of, um, one was of earth that had everything, both braille as well as there's a way to print stuff. And, and I just met him at the, at the convention. His name is Dan Gardner. And he has a company that produces these units that can do images, make them tactile. And so the earth had maps and th things like that in there that, that were all tactile, so you could feel them. And they, there was one of the moon, and then there was a, a book of the solar system. And when I say a book, it was only basically this giant fold-out, uh, maybe two pages. Um, it was bound, though. So um, it was just very cool. And Dr. Marone brought this 3D-printed, I don't know if you would call it a map, of Orion, so you could feel Beetlejuice was the biggest thing because it has the I don't geez, he's gonna kill me because I don't remember if it was the biggest mass, the brightest. I don't I don't remember why, but it's very cool. And then so that was 3D printed. So the larger or the brightest, I guess it was the brightest, um, it was the largest dot on this on this uh 3D. Uh it's a, basically a I don't know, three by three square had Braille down at the bottom. It also had the word Orion down at the bottom that wasn't, it was somewhat tactile. I, I have trouble feeling, as I've said before. So I, I'm not quite sure how how tactile that was because I had trouble feeling it. I could feel the Braille and I could feel all the um, all the different stars within it and Orion's belt and all that stuff. But it was very cool. In fact, Liz is going to take it into Walden and uh, show it there. Uh, probably just give it to her former co-teacher and let her show it there. So so that was very it was very very cool. They and they were great. Everybody loved them and it was a lot of fun. 
It, it really made for a good hour and a half or whatever it was. And um, so Saturday, like I said, general session. Saturday night is a banquet. And Sunday morning was the business meeting. And we talk about different things, how the chapters are doing. Brian Mackey gives the treasurer's report, which was was a little bit ugly. And uh, I got to do a presentation. And my throat was so funny. Somebody told me on the bus, Lily told me on the bus, she said, I, I didn't know who that person was speaking. <laughs> but I really enjoyed doing that. When I found out I was presenting, and my, my topic was fundraising at the chapter level. And obviously, you know, I talk about that, <laughs> I talk about that pretty often. But I didn't prepare anything. I didn't write notes. I didn't jot anything down. I didn't make an outline. I thought, okay, I'm going to talk about, I talked to Eugenio and Denise about a fundraiser they had done with an Apple TV raffle. I went back and forth with, her, with Kirk Hunger from Greater Lehigh Valley, also the person who I worked at the Blind Bodega uh, for, and, and the vending uh, as well. Unfortunately, Kirk wasn't there. Uh, he had some heart issues and was back in the hospital, which was really disappointing because I was hoping to see him there. But before I had gone with my fundraising, all the other chapters talked about things. Oh, Capital Chapter talked about doing a Panera fundraiser where they're selling gift gift certificates for uh, $25. I think they make five bucks on them. And it's a very cool – to me, that's an easy one because if you go to Panera, why not just buy them – buy the gift card from them because they're making five bucks. It doesn't, again, just like when you use my Amazon link, it doesn't cost you anything more and it's supporting that organization. That kind of allowed me to just talk about ways to make people aware of your fundraiser and what to do and all that sort of thing. Uh, But the funny thing was, I I like to walk around while I talk. And unfortunately, right now I'm sitting down while I'm recording this because I use a different microphone and I can't stand. uh, It doesn't raise up high enough. Um, But when Lynn Heights handed me the mic, she's like, oh, and it's it's, you're not plugged in so you can wander off like you like. Unfortunately, because my throat was so weird, I brought my tea with me. So I'm holding my cane, my tea, and the microphone. So there was no walking around for me. I kind of kind of just moved a little bit behind the, the podium. And uh, I, I love speaking. I just love doing it. And I think it came off pretty good. Um, and I started it like I usually start an episode of White Canes Connect. So it was kind of funny. So people kind of laughed at that. So let's go back to the two things that I skipped past. Thursday afternoon, I was in a session called Code Jumpers, and this person was talking about coding. Most times when I hear the word coding, my eyes start to glaze over, and I I just, I don't know, parts of my brain shut down, but this person is talking, and my mobile rings. I'm like, I don't know who it is, but I'm going to answer it because I, I just am not getting what this guy is saying. So I get up from the table, I reach into my pocket, and I'm holding, at this point, my, my phone is always in my uh, front right pocket. I'm right-handed, so I usually hold the cane with my right hand. I put the cane in my left hand, and I'm trying to reach into my pocket, and my pocket was bent funny, so I had to like kind of lean to the left. And I'm still walking because I, I don't want to disturb everybody with my mobile ringing. And again, I don't know who this is yet. So as I'm doing that, and I'm not really sweeping with my cane, I'm kind of waving it back and forth, but I'm not really sweeping like you should do. And I kind of bump into some chairs on my left, and I'm walking pretty pretty quickly now. I always walk pretty quickly, and it's too quickly most of the times. The only time I slow down is when I really have no idea where I should turn or what's coming up or if there's a curb or whatever. And this this is the issue that I had on Thursday. I get my phone out, so I stop leaning and I overcompensate and go back to the right as I'm stepping forward with my right leg. And I slammed into the corner of a wall. And I'm like, oh my God, what the hell just happened? Why did I do that, dummy? And I thought my phone is still ringing. I just got to answer it. And I answer it. <laughs> and it's, it's Brian Fischler. And um, 
I asked him how he's doing, and he said, what was that noise? And I said, I just, <laughs> I just hit the corner of a wall back there. And the next thing I know, as I'm talking to him, as I'm trying to walk out of this bar, a ballroom, I feel my eye had been tearing. My, my left eye had been tearing all day. In fact, it probably teared the whole time I was there, just, just constantly. Like I was constantly crying out of my left eye. I wasn't. And it turns out what I was feeling run down my face <laughs> was not from my eye. It was from my forehead. I didn't know this yet because I didn't look at my hand. I was just curious why there was all this stuff running on the left side of my face into my mustache. I'm like, what's going on? And so I get out into the lobby outside of the ballroom. And I said, okay, I'm outside now. I can talk a little louder. I said, yeah, I got to find a tissue or something. My eye is tearing. I got to take care of it. And I look at my fingers and they're all bloody. (laughs) And I said, oh, I think I'm bleeding. And I said, well, I still got to find some tissues. And I, I walked to my left. And to the left was the registration table. So when you, when you got to the hotel, you had to – even if you registered online, you had to check in for the, for the convention. And Linda Mackey was there. And I said, Linda, do you have any tissues? She says, oh, my God. <laughs> I said, oh, is it that bad? And I'm still talking to Brian. He's like, do you want to go? I'm like, no, I'm good. Uh, Maybe in a minute we'll go. But, uh, you know, and she said, it's really bad. And I say a couple other things to Brian. And and I said, I'll I'll call you later. And and I did call him later. But I'll get to that in a minute. So I am bleeding everywhere. I am leaving a trail of blood. I'm sure there's still some DNA on that wall. And... Linda's handing me these tissues, and at first she's putting them up to my forehead. And I said, do you have gloves on? And she said, no. I said, well, all right, you know, maybe I should do it. I I mean, I don't know where I've been. (laughs) So, you know, I'm bleeding, and somebody else comes over. Somebody from the hotel comes over to check on me. And Linda says, you have to call an ambulance. I said, an ambulance for what? I'm good. It's going to stop. I'll be fine. And I'm sitting in this chair. And somebody from the hotel comes over and, and I didn't get his name and I'm disappointed because I saw him later in the week, uh, the later in the weekend and, and he asked me how he was doing and I, I knew who he was once he said I was one of the guys that helped you out the other day, but he never said his name. So I'm sorry that I don't know your name. Then Linda says, you really got to call 911. I said, I don't think we do. I, th- I think it'll be okay. Look, it's slowing down. It's not bleeding much now. Paul from the hotel comes over and he looks at it. He's like, oh, you've been concussed. He didn't say anything about the blood. So I was, I, I, that was the takeaway I got. I didn't think I was concussed because I, <laughs> I knew that Joe Biden was the president. I knew my birthday. I knew all the stuff that I needed to know. And he said, yeah, you should, you should go to the hospital. I said, hold on. I, I don't think I need to go. And it will ruin my day if I go to the hospital. So I took a picture. I don't know if I took the picture or if Linda took the picture. And I texted Liz. I said, Liz, does this look like it needs to go to the hospital or not? And the cut is right above what, what's weird. As I mentioned earlier, the blood was on the left side of my face and the left side of my mustache. But the cut is above my right eye. And I've always said to Liz, there are a million reasons why I will never hit the lottery. Where I hit my face was probably a quarter of an inch to a half an inch from hitting my nose. Had I hit my nose as hard as I did when I hit the wall, I would have broken my nose. And that would have really sucked. But I missed and I hit just above my right eye, which again is an eye that doesn't matter and uh, whatnot. So it doesn't matter uh, other than maybe a scar. I'm okay with it. These people are around and, and finally Lynn Heights, the president of the NFB of PA comes over. She's like, yeah, maybe we should call 911. I'm like, okay. And somebody had mentioned, maybe they could just stitch you up here. And I'm like, oh, that'd be great. I could do it right now. And so... They call 911 and they're talking to me, you know, what's going on, how did it happen, so forth and so on. And so then 
Ian and Bree come. They're the paramedics. And I'm talking to them. I'm like, I said, does it need stitches? And everybody's telling me, oh, it needs stitches. It needs stitches. I didn't really think it did. But, you know, I'm not a doctor, nor did I ever play one on TV, unlike my friend Ken. And they said, yeah, it needs stitches. I said, all right, you can do them here, right? Oh, no, we can't do that here. I said, why not? We're all here. I mean, it can't be a lot that you need. You need some thread, a needle, and maybe something to clean it up. No, we can't do that. We got to take you to the hospital. I said, all right, well, let's go. And I start to get up. No, 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 we'll get the gurney. I said, what do you mean get the gurney? Okay, go ahead and get it. Oh, no, we don't get that. The firemen get that. I said, there's more people here? So the gurney comes in. I get on that. We go out. And they try to load me into the ambulance on this gurney. And I'm not going to lie. At this point, I'm freezing because I've been holding a pack of ice up to my forehead to keep the swelling, uh, I guess, to a minimum. (laughs) And so they try to load me in the first time and the gurney goes up at the head end and they get the front wheels in. And I guess it's supposed to, once you get those wheels in, it's supposed to like lock in and then make it easy to, to go in. Well, that wasn't working. So they pull me out and try again. The next time they do it, the gurney almost falls out of, off the back of the ambulance. So at that point, I grab my phone because I'm not missing that if I fall from that. I'm going to have that on tape. Well, you know, tape. I mean, not tape. You know what I mean. Dating myself because anybody that was born in the last 20 years doesn't know what it means to record on tape. So I asked both Ian and Bree if it's okay if I record them. They said, okay. And they were mad because whoever was supposed to service the ambulance either didn't do it right or didn't do it at all. I said, listen, I can walk in there and get on myself, just like I told you in there. They said, okay. So they unbuckled me. They took the blanket off that they had on me. And I walked in on the side of the ambulance, and there were – Three seats that kind of reminded me of those jump seats that the stewardesses sit on on airplanes or a seat like you would have in a a, a van, um, you know, like a cargo van. And I guess that's kind of what this was, right? This is a cargo van for sick people. Um, so uh, Bree is driving. Ian buckles me in. And I again ask him, I said, is it okay if I record this? And he said, Yes. He said, is it video or audio? I said, well, it's going to be video, but I'm just going to pull the audio off and I'm going to use it on the podcast. What's your podcast called? And I showed him the back of my phone and, uh, oh, that's cool. And so he's just, you know, cleaning it up a little bit, cleaning my cut. And then he puts a bandage on, you know, like you see those guys, (laughs) if you think of the, the, uh, three guys from the the uh, you see in the like the revolutionary war where the guy's one head is bandaged you got to wrap around it and that that's what i was so we get to the hospital and i have to get into a very uncomfortable wheelchair and i said again i could walk in you don't have to wheel me in oh no it's okay i can we'll wheel you in and so we wheel uh, brie wheels me in we get inside the front door and it sounds like it's packed And I said to her, I said, be honest with me. It sounds pretty crowded in here. She said, yeah, there's a few people here. I said, oh, my God. I said, is it a marathon? She said, I don't know. Let's see what happens. So I'm sitting there in a wheelchair near somewhere where they print a bracelet. Uh, I don't know that girl's name who printed the bracelet. Uh, But she then tells them, take him to 37B. Oh, put him in 37B? She's like, no, not in 37B, the hallway by 37B. And there was a gurney there. And so I got onto that. The whole hallway going to this was just lined with gurneys with people on them. Sick people, of course, because it's a hospital. Remember that line from Airplane? A hospital? What is it? It's a building with sick people, but that's not important right now. (laughs) It was important because I was one of those sick people not in a room, just hanging out there in the hallway, texting and talking on my phone. And... And I got some coming up in, just listen, I've got some things. (laughs) I have both the ambulance ride, and they didn't use the siren, by the way. I was a little disappointed. But it also probably would have given me a headache to listen to that. 
I've got some sounds from that, and I've got some sounds from laying there on the gurney of the different machinery and all the people around me. So that's coming up. So I'm laying there, and I'm texting with Liz, and I'm and at some point I, I texted Jane. I don't remember if I texted her a picture. And uh, you can see the cut if you go to my Twitter feed. I, I put that up there, which was funny because the day before, we stopped at Johnstown, Pennsylvania on the way to Pittsburgh. And if you're familiar at all with movies from the late 70s, there was a movie that Paul Newman did called Slapshot, which is one of my favorite movies. It's a hockey movie. That might be why it's one of my favorites. But there is a line in it. There are a lot of great lines in it. But there is one line in it that I absolutely love because, of course, it's talking about me. Not me specifically, but in this case, it was me. Dave's a killer. Dave's a mess. And that was me. I was a mess that day. So uh, at David Benj on Twitter, you can have a look at that image. And um, again, three stitches wasn't a big deal. But when the doctor came over, his name, also na- his name was also David. So that made it easy, even if I was having some head issues <laughs> from bumping my head. And I said, well, that's, you know, and I said to him, I said, that'll make it easy to remember in case, in case things get a little fuzzy. As long as I remember my name, I'm going to remember yours. He was the doctor. James was the nurse. Both were very cool, very helpful. And both said, when I told them that I was missing Promancy Brothers for this, it's not a miss. <laughs> it wasn't something I needed to do. He, they both said very touristy, and it wasn't something that you were going to miss going to. You may be hungry later, but you can get something else. And we did get something else, and I'll talk about that in a second. But Simon and a couple of folks went to Promanti Brothers, and he actually texted me while I was laying on the gurney, and I had to text him back saying, hey, I had a little issue, can't go. And I don't remember exactly how much I told him at that point, but I was, I was bummed. And I really thought I was going to be at the hospital most of Thursday night and into Friday. And so they stitched me up, and it was it was funny because when David came over and started cleaning the cut, that hurt probably as much as hitting the corner of the wall and opening the cut in the first place. Not only that, but so this water stream is going into the cut and burning like you wouldn't believe, and then running down my shirt, even though David gave me all these towels to put around, some of it still trickled through my shirt, is running down inside my shirt and down my arm, and it was cold water. I'm sure it was saline, maybe not water. Whatever it was, it burned. It burned. <laughs> and so then he put some numbing cream on it, stitched me up, didn't feel a thing. Uh, and I was pretty much good to go until they told me, well, we'll get the tetanus shot for you. I'm like, oh my God, really? So then I texted Liz. I asked her when the last time I had a tetanus shot was. If she remembered, I had her look on the calendar because I, I never like getting those. I desperately didn't want to have a tetanus shot. I'm looking through the calendar on my phone. Liz is looking at home. Couldn't find anything. And David comes back. She said, did you find, he said, did you find anything? I said, no. I said, all right, I guess I have to take it. If you recommend me doing it, go ahead and do it. So James gave me the tetanus shot. And at that point, I was pretty much good to go. I had to use the bathroom. And of course, I didn't want to ask while I had to ride in the wheelchair, sit on the gurney. But when I was leaving, I asked James on the way out if I could use the bathroom, if he could show me. And I did. You know, he took me to one. And then he got me to the emergency exit, emergency room exit, so that I could call the Uber. And he said, I asked him if he would just hang tight to make sure I got the address right. It was the right address for where I was. The night before when we came in, everybody was getting different addresses for the train station, and I couldn't get any of the addresses (laughs) that everybody else was getting. So I finally said, search for it, and I had to search for the address for where I was standing. I got three different addresses. And I didn't want – it's happened before when I've traveled where I don't know the address that I'm at. So I just say, okay. And when I was in Harrisburg – I'm sorry, State College one year, the address happened to be across the street. So the driver canceled on me because I didn't show up for the car. I said, you know, I'm right here. And he's like, I don't see you. You don't see me. So I had to pay a cancellation fee. That kind of made me mad. So I didn't want to do that again. 
I know it's only five bucks or six bucks, whatever it is, but I don't want to pay it. So once I had the Uber ordered, I thanked James and he went back and did his nursing stuff. And I stood there and waited for William, the Tesla driving Uber driver. And got in the Uber once he showed up. And I always have trouble getting in those cars. I don't know why. I don't know where the door handles are. And I kind of feel all over, especially getting out. And evidently, it's just a button in the back. And I can never find it. Usually, the driver ends up reaching over before I could find it and hitting whatever it is you need to hit. So he took me on this tour, and he thought he went the wrong way. But the cool thing was, the way we went actually ended up being faster than he thought it would be. And I got to cross two rivers at that point, two of the three. So I crossed two of the three rivers while I was out there in Pittsburgh, the Monongahela, which our hotel was right along the banks of, and the Ohio. And we drove past, as we were driving past some things, he said, oh, there's the Steelers Stadium, and there's the Pirates Stadium. And I said, well, where's where's the Penguins place? And uh, it was, I guess it wasn't as visible. It was behind, like a block behind, I don't remember which one, if it was the Steelers or the Pirates and it would have been fun to have been, over, been able to go over there. So really, the only thing that I saw while I was in Pittsburgh, other than the hotel and the street that the restaurants were on that we went to a couple of different ones, <laughs> was on the ride back from the hospital and the hospital's ER. That's what I saw. That's what I saw off Pittsburgh and whatever was outside the windows of the hotel. And I had a great view outside my uh, hotel window. But, you know, I wasn't, in the room that much to even look out. But the, the the first day I woke up there, I guess it was Thursday morning. It was right before the sun came up and there was some bridge in the distance. And I took this picture. And again, same thing goes, uh, that is on, I think I put that on Instagram and maybe even Twitter. So again, at David Benjamin, both, as I've said, all the socials and my voice is going, so I can't do it as normal. So I got back to the hotel and I had texted Lisa to see if she had gone to Permanente Brothers with the others and she did not. So she and Donna and Becca all didn't go. And there was a veterans thing that was happening that night. And I certainly wasn't going to go to that because I was I, I was at the hospital when it started. And I got back to the hotel somewhere between 7.30 and 8 o'clock and Lisa said, we're going to go at 8 to go for dinner. I said, okay, where are we going? And she said, we're going to that southern place that Denise recommended. I said, okay, that sounds cool. And I didn't realize it, but it was right down the street from the hotel also. It was called Tupelo Honey. And it was really, really good. I don't know. It seemed like it was one of those types of places that was a chain. Uh, it was a big space, high ceilings, really nice. The food was great. And uh, we ordered too much, of course. We all got biscuits, and the biscuits were... If you cut a softball in half, that's around the size of a biscuit, and it probably <laughs> probably weighed a pound. So uh, that was really good. So it, it turns out I, it didn't ruin my night going to the ER. I was only there a few hours. I, I don't even know what time we went over. I'd have to look to see <laughs> to look to see what time Brian called me that day to see what time everything happened because I, I just don't remember. The funny thing is, I wasn't supposed to be in that session. I was supposed to be helping Stacy do some forms that people were going to fill out. I was going to take their answers and input them. Stacy was going to do it and she thought if there were a lot of people, she would need help. And so when I had texted Stacy, I'm like, "Where are you and where do we do these forms?" She's like, "I don't know. I I don't know where everything's happening. I don't know." I said, "When you find out, let me know." And I don't think it ever happened. So I'm not quite sure. And I'll get into that more in a second about the organization of, of everything. So one thing that there, – there's a song that I like out right now. It's by a band called Inhaler. And the song is called Love Will Get You There. But there's a line in it that says, slow down, my friend. And I constantly tell myself to slow down because I do walk too quickly. And I'm usually fearful because this happened once when I we lived at the condo and I went out of the apartment without my cane and I ran into someone, an older woman, and I nearly knocked her down and they, you know, the people gave me the what for. And I said, I'm sorry, I didn't see her. And they said, how could you not have seen her? We're, you know, right here. 
I didn't go into it. I just said, I'm sorry, I didn't see her. So maybe I'll learn my lesson. We'll see. We will see. As far as the overall, the convention was great. And there's, there's one more thing. There's a lot of drama that happened too, and I'll get into that in a sec. But one of the things, one of the other takeaways from me for the event was something was disorganized. I don't know if it was from the NFB side, NFB of Pennsylvania side. I don't know if it was this, the hotel. I don't know if it was a combination. For example, how many times have you gone to a restaurant when you have multiple courses, let's say you're having a salad and then you're having something else to eat for dinner and then you have a dessert and the dessert is a cake. Now, to me, in my mind, I'm thinking I need three forks, at least two forks, because I can use the salad fork with the entree, but I don't want to use the entree fork with the dessert. We only got one fork for every meal. So on Saturday, when it was a sit-down lunch, not a boxed lunch, and I'll get to the boxed lunch issue in a minute, I had a Caesar salad with grilled chicken on it. And then they had cheesecake for dessert. There were no forks for the cheesecake. I am there sucking on my fork to get every bit of garlic Caesar dressing and Parmesan off of my fork so my strawberry cheesecake does not taste like (laughs) garlic Parmesan strawberry cheesecake. As my mom used to say, ah, it's all going to the same place, (laughs) which is true. So I thought that was weird. Meals that were sit-down meals, it was like pulling teeth to get water. And at one point at lunchtime, Maria Seferati, Simon's mom, went out to the bar that was in the lobby area to get glasses of water for people at our table. She would try to get the people who were serving the lunches in our room, in the, in the ballroom, to get us water. It just wasn't happening. It was just unreal. It was slow to get anything like that. Now, the funny thing was Sunday when we had a buffet breakfast and another table that had coffee and juice and tea, they were much more helpful. So I don't know if they were short-staffed because they had other events going on and that was the issue. We have, for the first couple of days of the convention, they offer a box lunch. And I want to say it's like 15 bucks. And the box lunch usually is boxed up, ready for you. You just go in, you give your ticket. It has either veggie or uh, chicken or beef, whatever, whatever, the, whatever you ordered. There's usually at least two, sometimes three choices. I always get veggie. And the veggie was great. I get it, I had it both Thursday and Friday. It was a veggie wrap. So good. Roasted veggies. I, I love those. And it was really good from this place, from this hotel. Sheridan Pittsburgh Hotel at Station Square. So things like that were great, but they didn't have it boxed up. And they didn't have someone there. At least when I first got there, they didn't have anybody there. And I had no idea what was in front of me. And then as I was starting to get stuff and Lisa had come over to, (laughs) as she said, when she's with her blind friend, she's the sighted one. And when she's with her sighted friend, she's the blind one. Somebody had told her that. I think Jeff Thompson from Blind Abilities had told that to her. And it's true. It's exactly true for her. She's helping me find the veggie wrap. And then someone comes over from the hotel and there are these cookies and these cookies were so good. They were probably bigger than a hockey puck and thick and heavy. And I love oatmeal raisin cookies. And he said, oh, there weren't many oatmeal raisin. Which kind did you want? I said, I'll just grab one. And I just put my hand in and grabbed one, put it in my bag. Turns out it was oatmeal raisin. I was so excited when I ate that. (laughs) And it was so good. Uh, They also had fruit. The bananas seemed like they would have probably been ripe next July. I I could hardly peel it. It was that hard. And even when I was peeling, you know, when you peel a banana, you can peel from top to bottom. You couldn't peel this banana from top to bottom. The peel was separating from itself. That's how hard it was. 
And then when I tried to take a bite, it was so hard. So I took the one bite and that was it. And I hate wasting things like that. Ziggy would have loved it because he loves anything. And he especially loves bananas. And in fact, somebody texted me today at Banana O'Clock and I took a couple of minutes to get back to them because I was throwing him chunks of banana on his birthday. So the fact that they didn't have someone there to say, okay, which did you get? Here's, here, let me have your ticket. And then have them put everything in the bag for you. Same thing goes. They, so you got a sandwich, you got a piece of fruit, you got a cookie, and you got a bag of chips. And then you could get I, – I got bottled water. I, 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 that's all I wanted. So I don't know if they had other things there. I, I didn't look and I knew that the, the one buck that I'd reached in had bottled water. That's all I wanted. When I grabbed the chips, I had no idea what kind of chips I got. And when I sat down, somebody else looked at them and um, – and Lisa said, oh, they had other chips there. I said, oh, well, yeah, go ahead and switch these then. If they had, I really want pretzels. I don't want chips or corn chips. And they may have had Fritos. I don't know what they were. So she went back and she brought two things back to me. And the guy gave her the what for. The, they had two guys there now. And, and they were, as Lisa said, they were acting more like bouncers than anything else. And I said, no, just put them both back. I'm good. I don't need either one. And then she brought me back the bag of whatever. And I said, no. And she was going back up for somebody else. I said, here, put those back. I'm not going to eat them. And nobody else wanted them at the table. So that was, again, the disorganization, the fact that you've got all these people coming in for lunch. Nobody was taking the tickets at this point. So anybody could go over, even if you didn't order the lunch. So that was, it was just unorganized. Another thing that was an issue, and again, not sure it was the hotel or the affiliate, the NFB of Pennsylvania, about a month before the convention, I was asked, because they had run out of rooms, if I would share a room. And I had roomed with Eugenio from Greater Philly at Washington Seminar. And I said, yeah, I'd be fine rooming with Eugenio. I said, but I think I've got just one king bed. And I said, I like Eugenio, but not that much to share a bed with him. And this person laughed and said, okay, I never heard anything else. Friday morning comes and I get a call from Eugenio. Yeah, I'm on my way. I said, oh, okay, cool. So I'll see you when you get here. Yeah, where's our room? I said, what do you mean, our room? I said, I was under the impression we weren't rooming. Oh, no, we're rooming. I said, are you sure? And he said, yeah. I said, all right, well, let me find out and make sure and um, I'll get back to you or see you when you get here. So I called the person who was the chairman of the event and I said, yeah, I just found out from Eugenio, we're rooming together. Is that true? Yeah, somebody should have told you. I said, nobody told me. Just like nobody told me I was going to be speaking on Sunday. So I had to hurry up and go upstairs. And I did not get one king bed. There were two queens. So it was fine. It was just the whole premise that I was completely blindsided by it. Can I say that? <laughs> so I scurry up to the 12th floor, room 1208. And, you know, I was sleeping on one bed and the other bed had all sorts of junk on there. My goodie bag that I had, my t-shirt that I bought from the blind parents group in another one of their fundraisers and some other stuff. I don't, I don't even remember what else. But I was on the phone to Liz and I said, you know, I'm rooming with Eugenia. She said, you are? I didn't think you were. I said, I didn't either. I said, but I'm cleaning my room up like it was my parents coming to visit me at the dorm when I was in Miami. <laughs> That's what it felt like. And I told Eugenio that. And I had to make sure I gave him plenty of room and set stuff up so he had he had a place to put his stuff. Again, because you got to figure out with two blind folks in there, I don't know what I'm grabbing for. I want to know where all my stuff is. And it did throw me for a little bit because I was – knew where everything was when I was on my own there because I had things set up. There was a, a, a table on there and the table was very cool. It was a sit-stand table. And I didn't realize it at first. And I put my backpack right in the middle and evidently that's where the button was. So all of a sudden the table goes up. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I wonder how it's doing that. I didn't know if it sensed that I was over there. So I took everything out and I had uh, some snacks on one side. I had some medicine in the middle and then I had some stuff on the other side. Just so I knew, I knew when I walked to this section, when I walked to this table, here's where everything was. And I could remember that. 
Same thing in the bathroom. I remembered where I put this and that. There were two different bottles on the vanity that had some sort of lotion or soap in them. I got my phone out. I had it read both of them. The one that wasn't the hand wash, I moved far away so I wouldn't mistakenly use that to try and wash my hands. And so I had all that set up. And so all was good there. So when Eugenio came and I'm scurrying to put everything somewhere, I kind of did it in a hurry and I didn't remember where I did this or where I did that. So it kind of threw me uh, for the next day or so. And maybe the hit to the head <laughs> didn't help either. But I don't know. I, the head, My head never really bothered me. My head probably bothered me as much as getting the tetanus shot in my left arm. So, so that went down. And then... But on the flip side of the hotel, everybody was so nice, minus the two guys who were like the bouncers at the lunch uh, on Thursday or Friday. Everybody was trying to be as helpful as could be, and it was just it was just very nice. I mean, how they how they treated all of us. So I, again, I don't know what the situation was. Now the other thing, the other main thing that happened there was some drama. At these conventions, a lot of things go on. There are You vote on things, you vote on resolutions. And the way the resolutions work, there's a resolutions committee. They usually meet after the NFB of Pennsylvania board meets. And they talk about resolutions that have been submitted. And this year there were only two. And they are long. Sometimes they are so long. In fact, Michelle was reading the first resolution and Harriet couldn't find her phone. And we're looking for her phone and she's reading the resolution and she's looking and we're looking and I'm calling it. And finally she said, oh, I remember having the phone when I was in the committee, Harriet's on the state board. So when they did some sort of meeting upstairs in one of the other ballrooms that we have or meeting rooms or whatever you want to call it, I said, well, let's go look up there. So we go up there and I call it and we hear it and there it is sitting on a chair. She was very happy. And so we're talking about things as we're walking back down and we walk in and Michelle was still reading the first resolution. (laughs) So then I go to the bathroom. I come back from the bathroom and she's still reading the first resolution. And then finally she votes on it. And then they read the second resolution. This is where all the fun happened. They read the the second one. It wasn't as long as the first one. And they're talking about it, the members of the resolution committee. At this time, only the resolutions committee can talk about it and vote on it. Everybody else gets a chance to speak at the general business meeting on Sunday morning. So one of the people who were listening wanted to say something, and she was denied. And again, she asked to be heard, and again, she was denied. And multiple people in the room from Lynn, the president of the affiliate, to a couple people in the resolutions committee, all said, you'll have your chance on Sunday to have your say. And she started dropping the F-bomb and carrying on, and it was just out of line, completely out of line. And I thought, oh my gosh, this was crazy. I mean, and this went on for, I I don't know how long, 10 or 15 minutes. It was a mess. It was a complete mess that shouldn't have been. Sunday morning comes and I'm waiting for some fireworks when they're doing the resolutions. Before we get to the resolutions, this person resigned completely from the organization. Any divisions she was in and... Ahead, the head of, she resigned from the Keystone chapter, everything. She's out of the organization. Now, there probably would have been some sort of disciplinary action because of the dropping of the F-bombs during this public meeting that also went out over a stream. But I guess we'll never know. Well, the fallout 
which I thought ended with her resignation on Sunday, continued after the convention. I got a call, I guess it was yesterday, from Lynn asking me to help with the email list serve and the email addresses, uh, accounts that they use, the affiliate uses. And I said, yeah, I said, I would do that. The person who had the meltdown at the resolutions committee is, is married to the first vice president of the affiliate, the NFB of Pennsylvania. And when I say affiliate, that means the NFB of Pennsylvania, just so I don't have to keep saying both. He resigned his position within the NFB. And the magnitude of that is huge. It is not going to be easy to take all the things that he did and do them. He was the convention chair. He has a master's in some sort of computer engineering, something, something. So he was able to do a lot of things for the affiliate. And one person isn't going to fill his shoes. And last night after I got an email with some passwords that Lynn had told him to shoot to me. I'm looking at this account at DreamHost, and I was so sad for it because this guy was so instrumental in a lot of things. And (laughs) the only thing that I could think of is, I can't believe she blew it all up. And I was thinking of Charlton Heston on the beach seeing the broken up Statue of Liberty and Planet of the Apes. She blew it all up. One person, one person did this. And I I was just sad for it. And it was, and that was the drama. Not to mention, besides me banging my head, Donna, was a little bit older than me. I won't go into how much older because I don't know, but she is older. She had fallen when she was on a walk along the river with Harriet. She scraped her knee. Now, one thing that was funny, she needed to go back. She wanted to go back to her room. She was sharing a room with Lisa. Lisa got sick early on and I was teasing Lisa when she started coughing. I said, oh, that sounds like COVID. Well, it turns out it wasn't. Just some sort of cold. I don't even want to call it the flu because I don't think it is. So Lisa was in bed for at least a third of the convention. So people were taking her food. Mostly Harriet was taking her food or Donna was taking her food. But at one point, Donna asked me if I would take her back up to the room because she didn't want Lisa to be by herself in the room in case she needed something. So... She grabbed my arm, Donna grabbed my arm, and I'm leading her out of the ballroom where things were going on. And I said, all right, she's, everybody started calling me Scarface, which I like. <laughs> I'm not nearly as ruthless. And people started calling Donna Wounded Knee. And I said, come on, Wounded Knee, let's go. She's like, all right, Scarface. I said, I said to her, I said, we're the crippled cripples. I said, I don't know if we could say that. I don't think a lot of people here would like that. But I said, I'll say it. And Donna, of course, didn't get offended. Other people, if they heard me, would have. So we went back up there, and and Lisa was under the covers with the chills. And funny thing is, I was around 12 hours to 14 hours behind her. When she started talking about having the chills, I got them. She, She got them late morning on Saturday. I got them Saturday night at around 11 while I was packing up to go home the next day. And it wasn't terrible. I, I, I never felt that horrible. But I didn't go out after th- uh, things ended on Saturday night. I just went up and 
late in bed. I talked to Jane for a little bit. I hadn't talked to her all day. And she had an event that day, which is unusual. She doesn't usually have events on Saturday, but she was in an event. And so she was telling me about that and some other things. And so when Eugenio came in later, and the night before I had gone to the bar with Eugenio and Denise and a guy named Kevin Cross, who has the essential cane keeper. If you listen on White Canes Connect, when he was on, he and Victoria Herrera were on. And that was our, that's still our number one downloaded episode. And it was nice to meet him in person. He's a really cool guy. And I don't remember what episode it is, which is funny because I sat next to Dr. Marone at the banquet. And every time somebody would mention somebody there, I'd say, you could listen more about them in episode blah, blah, blah of White Canes Connect. And uh, so it was very cool to sit next to him and talk to him. So something, some bug went around and everybody was getting sick. Lisa took a COVID test right after she got home. I took one a few hours later. Both of ours were negative. So so it wasn't COVID, but like I said, it's some sort of cold. I still have it. I think she's she's also still got something, but not nearly like what it was. So And everybody's sniffling and coughing and whatnot. So the one thing that I did not do because of that, when I started to not feel good, I did not go and meet Chuck Morgenstern, who is the oldest member of the NFB of Pennsylvania. I, because I did I didn't want to be the one <laughs> I didn't want to be the one that gave him something that then, you know, put him on that final downward spiral. So I didn't go over and introduce myself. Again, because I wasn't sure what I had and if it was COVID, it wouldn't wouldn't have been good. So I didn't worry uh about anything else. But I really have to thank I have to tell you, I have to thank um Linda Mackey, I mean, she was doing all sorts of things to help us out and help me out. Uh, and she always buzzes around the place uh, when she's when she's at these events. And uh, it's just really helpful. She's really helpful. She, she is sighted, and she's actually the one that she drove out there uh, with Brian. She drove Brian out there, I should say. She, not with Brian. Brian didn't drive. Brian is the treasurer, and I told him, I said, nobody wants that job. You just make sure you do it well. And he could have it for the rest of his life. The cool thing is he's very young, so he'll have it for many, 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 many years. So that was that was the trip. And then the coach home was fun. I won an auction of Connie's cookies, which were back for the first time in a few years, which was great. The auction on Friday night is always a boatload of fun. And there was also a talent show portion of it, which was cool. So they did a couple of talent stuff, and then they did an auction, and they did some more talent. I'll tell you, it was very cool to hear some of the folks perform. Uh, one of the guys was Carl Smith, who was our national representative from the NFB of Utah. He did a song or two. Uh, Alex Cohen from Accessible Pharmacy did a couple of songs, also very cool. Uh, he, <laughs> I'd never met him. And I went over to meet him on Saturday and I was talking to him for a little bit and I said, you know, I'll never forget what you said at last year's convention. You talked about having your driver's license. He said, oh, I got something better this year. I just renewed my driver's license and I'm going to get a concealed carry permit. <laughs> so he says he wasn't sure that he'd ever buy a gun, but he's going to have the permit just in case. So I thought that was pretty funny and pretty cool. So it was nice to meet him. And I got to talk to Andy from Accessible Pharmacy also. And we had talked before, both on White Canes Connect and at other times. And they were one of the sponsors of Believe You Can, which was greatly appreciated with those cool thermometers and whatnot. So on the, uh, we had the coach home that Keystone uh, chartered. And so I had all these cookies. So I walked up and down the aisle passing some out, which was also very fun. And, um, uh, folks enjoyed those, especially Aaron. <laughs> so that was, that was the convention. It was good to get back and, um, it was good to be away though. And I always enjoy going this week's just listen. It's going to be some sounds, like I said, from getting in the ambulance, being in the ambulance and being in the ER. And it's just kind of funny how, Everything was in the ER, just people rushing around past and going into these different rooms that, of course, I never got and a lot of other people along the outside. And I wasn't there long, so I, I don't really think I needed one. Of course, I didn't think I needed to be there to begin with. And it probably was a good idea. I thought about it more 
as the days went on. And I probably would have opened that cut up 8 million different times while I was in Pittsburgh. And the one thing that sucked was <laughs> I got blood all over my shirt. And it was a shirt that I liked. So I'm hoping when Liz did the OxyClean the other day and then washed it, hopefully the blood came out because I like that shirt. But here is the medical version <laughs> of Just Listen. So it went in that way that time without me? It normally automatically will lift to like the level with the ambulance and go in. Okay. And then without you on it, it still didn't do it properly. But okay. then I just had to manually lift. This stretcher probably weighs almost two or three hundred pounds. I'm just going to bandage Okay. So you're good if I get a mercy though? Yeah. Okay. I'll hold the mask on Okay. It's funny to hear that stuff in the ER because I was laying there when I wasn't texting. I was just laying there listening to everything and hearing all the different things going on. There was a, a person in a gurney by my feet and on the other side of the aisle. They were playing a game and then they were texting with people and calling people and stuff like that. I don't know what was wrong with this person, but they were – pretty much doing what I was doing, texting and calling and so forth. So that was kind of interesting. And then you hear there's a whole bunch of people to my immediate left across the aisle. There was a room where there were a whole bunch of people. I don't know if they were inputting data, if they were checking different things. I don't know what they were doing in there. I don't know. Uh, but there was there were a few people in there. It wasn't it didn't seem like it was a room with somebody in it. It seemed more like a like a desk setup or tables where people were working. So I'm not sure what that was. And again, just it was just constantly people moving around, doctors rushing back and forth, nurses rushing back and forth. So it was just very interesting. I'd never, it's been a while since I've been in the ER. That is all I have for episode 206. And I apologize for the different sound issues that I, you can hear how it starts to fade away. Then I cough and then my voice comes back. So that is the reason you hear those differences because of editing and the coughing and whatnot. That is all I have for this episode. Please reach out. I'd love to hear from you. I can't see you podcast at gmail.com. I can't see you podcast at gmail.com. Please reach out. If you have questions, comments, show ideas, complaints. <laughs> if you have a review, I'd love it. Shoot it my way. I can't see you podcast at gmail.com. You can also call me at 646-926-6350. Same criteria, questions, comments, show ideas, reviews, complaints, an STFU on the fantasy football. <laughs> Whatever you got, reach out. Please leave your name in town. If you do leave a voicemail, you have up to three minutes. So again, 646-926-6350. As always, show notes are available over on the website, I can't see you.com slash 206. I C A N T C U dot com slash 206. Remember, I can't see you sounds like a whole sentence. It's only seven characters long. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of I Can't See You. I really do appreciate it. Be well, stay safe, and I will talk to you next week. 
Thank you for listening to the I Can't See You podcast with David. Please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. And don't forget to share the podcast with your friends.